continue on here. If anybody looks kind of tired and groggy this morning, uh, it would be board members and Jesse and Marcy and myself. Uh, part of us were at a function last night sponsored by the district where uh, I, as your pastor, had to give a report for our church. And uh, I, I told some of them this morning, I'm going to send the letter and DS a note and say, we don't mind coming to those things, but we're old. Plan it during the day so we can get home and get to bed. Even Jesse's agreeing with that. And uh, But it was a good evening, a lot of reports from a lot of pastors. And one thing that kept coming to me over and over last night as we were listening to the reports of all the pastors, Nazarene pastors in the area and my own report was that part of our success as a Christian is prayer. We need prayer. I, I spoke uh, here the last few weeks about the power of prayer. If we fail to pray, we're missing the whole mark. Then we just become a social club without a purpose. We're a social club, but it's a social club to reach out and evangelize, to have spiritual growth in our lives. And in order for that to happen, we have to pray. I've seen some amazing answers to prayer just over the last couple of weeks. They're not my answers to share with you. They're other folks, and hopefully they'll feel comfortable with sharing them soon. But God is answering prayers. He's on His throne. He's, he's doing what He does. We have to pray. I'm thinking in particular a story I shared last night about prayer and the power of prayer is, is um, most of you remember uh, Jim Brower and Dorothy, of course. Um, Jim joined this church back in the early 60s, the same as Dorothy did. He walked away from the Christian life, and for some reason he was never taken off the membership roles of the church. When I became the pastor here 21 and a half years ago, I met Jim because we needed some plumbing work done, and Dorothy said, call my ex-husband. And so I had this relationship on and off with Jim for that whole time until he passed away. And, and I knew the story, and I knew that Dorothy was praying for Jim. And I, I just, every time we'd go through and look at the roles of who need to be taken off or who's moved away or whatnot, I just never felt like confronting the issue of Jim. I always felt just checked about it. And you remember about a year ago now, Jim accepted Jesus as a Savior, recommitted his life. And I knew he had done it simply by the look on his face, by the twinkle in his eyes, by the change of attitude, and, and by the, 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 his language. His language was totally different. Dorothy's prayers were answered. Keep on praying. We have to have that prayer. I have people all the time talking about issues in their life. You want to know how to live? Get into this book. This is your owner's manual for your spiritual life and for a lot of other areas of your life as well. You want to be a success as a Christian? Get in the Word. You need it. You want to be a success as a Christian? Uh, Steve Bernson and I were talking this morning about, about uh, lack of church attendance. It's not just here. Lack of church attendance is a big issue everywhere. There's too many things going on, and, and people are going here and there, and, and work schedules are crazy. We got a message last night. The kids you picked up this morning, they wanted to come to Sunday school today. Their mother had to work, so she couldn't bring them. The, the time just interfered. We're running to this all the time, people having to work on Sundays. And so churches have gotten to where they're doing different services, different time during the week, trying to keep people involved in church. Do you know church has become an alternate lifestyle? There's so few people in church in the nation every Sunday. What did we learn last night? Like less than half of our county is in church on Sundays, I think we heard. Way less. Um, you have to have that church involvement to help your spiritual. You've got to be involved with other Christians. But now I have something else I want to throw out to you this morning that is, is uh, part of our Christian life. The power of generosity. Luke 6, 37 and 38 says, Do not judge and you will not be judged. 
Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Given and it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together and running over will be poured into your lap for with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. I find it amazing that those two verses are together because in some ways they appear to be disconnected subjects. Don't judge, give. But at the same time, they're talking about a spirit of generosity in how we treat others and how we deal with life. Now, I know what you're thinking right now. I'm looking in your minds. I know what you're thinking. Pastor, you're going to make us squirm and feel uncomfortable. Yeah, I am. You're going to talk about money, and you're going to ask for more, and you're going to tell us to tithe, and most of us give and 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 give, and we don't need to hear it. Am I right? Some of you are smiling. Here's some shocking news. God doesn't need your money. Oh, that got some attention. I'm not going to beg for your money. God doesn't need you to do any work in this church. I'm not going to beg for you to do things for the church. But here's what I am going to tell you. To be a successful Christian, you must learn the joy of giving and of serving others. There's a whole bunch of scriptures. Proverbs 11:24. Give freely and you'll become more wealthy. Be stingy and you'll lose everything. I'm just going to give it all away. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, Proverbs 22.9 Whoever is generous will be blessed because he has shared his food with the poor. Malachi 3.10 Bring one-tenth of your income into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. See if I won't open the doors of heaven for you and flood you with blessings. 2 Corinthians 9, 6-7, God loves a cheerful giver. I, I, I have to admit, that one has really spoken to me down through the years. I've always given my tithe, and when I haven't, God got it anyhow, uh, one way or another. But sometimes I've written that tithe check begrudgingly. What else could I do with this money? <laughs> God loves a cheerful giver. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 15.10 says, Give generously to the poor, not grudgingly, for the Lord will bless you in everything you do. Matthew 6.2, When you give, do it in secret. John 3.16, For God so loved that He gave His only Son. A lot of verses there about giving. But then I, I come back to Luke chapter 6, and it talks about two areas. One is how we treat others. Judge not. I, I've, I've threatened to really preach on that one one of these days. Um, I, I suppose I could really, really get wound up about that. But then I'd have to make sure that I'm not involved in judging either. For now, I'm going to say treat each other with the same respect you want to be treated. We're looking here at is it talks about not judging about prejudice. And, and it's not a racial prejudice, but sometimes I see downright hatred towards other people. Judging and assuming. You can't stand that person. You don't want to be around them. You don't want to deal with them. We're, we're looking at that in our world right now, in, in, in the politics of the world right now. I, I don't preach about politics, but, but in the politics right now, we're, we're seeing so many people just tearing each other apart. There, there's hatred there. They, they can't stand each other. Statements are being made that someday, hopefully somebody will feel bad about the fact that they made it and, and do some repenting there. Don't judge. Don't condemn. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Which if I read that in between the lines, there's telling me if I don't forgive, then I'm not going to be forgiven. And elsewhere it says that in the Bible. If you don't forgive other people, God's not going to forgive you. So part of this, part of this whole thing of generosity is having a spirit of generosity towards others that gives them the benefit of the doubt, that doesn't judge them, that helps encourage them, that helps lift them up. If we're going to win the world, 
We're going to have to be able to tolerate them and to love them and to deal with them. If we're going to love the world, we've got to be able to love each other and tolerate each other and deal with each other. Don't judge and you won't be judged. It's just a principle in life that that's being generous towards other people. Allowing them into your life. Getting into their life. Then verse 38, given it shall be given. This is not a prosperity message. I've heard prosperity preaching most of my whole life. If you do this, you'll get this in return. If you want a Cadillac, go out and give $10,000 to the church and tomorrow morning you'll find a Cadillac in your driveway. I don't want a Cadillac. I'm happy with what I have, thank you. But I don't believe it works that way either. But it's just a simple fact. There's a giving principle Kindness and generosity, if you pass it on, is going to come back to you. So many times we go to God and we just, we just get to begging God for things and, and talking to Him and just begging and begging and begging. And, and when I look at this verse, what it says to me, and I, I believe it's in the King James Version that says, if you give, it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together, and pouring over. Will men pour into your bosom? Well, I, I stop and look and think, if I'm generous with other people, there's going to be people who are generous with me. If I'm helping those who are less fortunate, and, and I come up to a time in my life where I'm less fortunate, I'm going to find people who are willing to help me. I also am looking at the opposite side here. If I give garbage to other people, you know what they're going to give back to me? If I give hatred to other people, you know what they're going to give back to me? You see, what I give, I'm going to give back. And so I just need to remember that if I give and it will be given to me, it's going to be given in the same measure that I use, with the same judgment that I use, with the same condemnation that I use, with the same lack of forgiveness that I give. But if I give into a good measure... It's going to come back to me a good measure. And so this whole spirit of generosity, this whole power of generosity, it becomes a lifestyle. It becomes my attitude towards others. It becomes my attitude towards God and their attitude towards me, and it just adds to my life. I look at this whole thing of tithing and giving to the church. Some have said that Malachi 3.10, bring your tithe to the storehouse, is just an old-fashioned idea. I, I, I heard a sermon on tithing back when I was in college. I heard it over at, uh, at, at, at uh, what's that, BVM? Blessed, what do they call that? The Catholic Church next to campus. Yeah, blessed, yeah. I, I, I heard a message around tithing that... that I thought, hmm, that's interesting. The, the, the priest that day was speaking about giving. He said, give 5% of your income to the church. Give another 1% to other places, and then take 4% and go on a vacation. Tithe to yourself. I thought, wow, that's interesting. That's not what my Bible says. And, and, and I've heard that in United Methodist churches. I, I've heard it other places as well. I don't know where that came from because the Bible says, bring your whole tithe, one-tenth, into the storehouse that there will be meat on my table. Now, when I think about what it was talking there, it's talking about bringing a tenth of your grain into the storehouse. It's talking about bringing a tenth of your, the good part of your animals to the storehouse. We, we picked up a half a cow the other day. It rumbled around in the back of the truck on the way up here. We could hear it. It was dead. It was frozen, but it just was sliding around a little bit. And it reminded me that there was a church that I was an assistant pastor at years back, Adrian, Michigan. And uh, we had a family of that church that gave us a whole hog every year. They just gave it to us. They did the same thing to the pastor, whole hog every year. They'd call and say, it's time for the hog. How do you want it butchered? And we would tell them, man, we had fresh pig a whole year, whole, all year long. There was another family in the church related to them who were cattle farmers. And every year 
they would call and say, we're going to give you a half of a cow. All you need to do is pay for the butchering. Well, that half a cow equaled about what the whole pig did. And butchering didn't cost that much. How do you want it taken care of? And so we would get a half of a cow every year. Now, that half of a cow we got the other day was divided three ways. I mean, we got a lot of meat in our freezer, but back then we had kids at home, so it was good. Marcy did get a cow tongue one year accidentally. Somehow we got a cow tongue, and she put it in the oven to bake it, and when the thing stood straight up and jumped out of the oven, she decided to throw it away. We weren't going to eat it. But also in that church, Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, we would get home because it was farm country. We had an enclosed porch, and there'd be bags and bags of fresh fruit, fresh vegetables, all kinds of things on our porch. We had a chicken farmer in that church, and occasionally he would bring a chicken to us and say, here, ring its neck, you got a chicken. Now, he would bring it ready to cook. It, it brought this whole thing of bringing a tenth into the storehouse. Well, that doesn't apply to us today, so that's old-fashioned so much. Most of you don't have sheep running around your yard or cattle or pigs. I, I do know one family in the church has chickens. At least they did for a while. You can have those in town now, by the way, I think. But when it talks about tithe to me, most of us have a job, we go out, we go to work, or you're living on retirement from the years that you collected pay. And so that tithe becomes a tenth percent of your income. Now, we're not going to get into prosperity. We're not going to beg for your money. I'm just saying if, if you want God to bless your life, you need to be giving to Him. Malachi 3.10 says, Test me in this and see what I will do. I will open the doors of heaven and send out such a blessing that you cannot contain it. Now back then it meant their crops were going to grow. Their lives were going to be happy. What does it mean to us today? Our money is going to stretch a little bit further. What does it mean to us today? It means the same thing it did then. Every need I have will be taken care of if I'm generous. Your tithe belongs to God. All I'm going to say about it right now is just very simple. God does not necessarily want our tithe. He wants our total stewardship. He owns it all anyhow. Psalms 50.10 says, Every animal of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. My response is to be a good steward of what He has allowed me to have. I will say this to you. If I give my 10% to God and I spend the rest of my money wisely, He's going to take care of me. The only challenge I throw out whenever I preach like this is, if you're tithing, you can testify to the fact that God is giving and giving and giving back to you, that your needs are being met. If you're not tithing, try it. And I don't just mean a $10 offering. I mean... Test God and give Him a 10% of your income. See what kind of a blessing He will bring to you. If you're not doing anything in particular in the church, you're just sitting down, start getting involved. Get involved with others. Get involved in their lives and see if God doesn't bless you. Well, enough about money. And everybody said, I knew you wanted to do that. How do I serve God successfully? How do I have a life of generosity? I serve Him by finding and using my spiritual gifts. We're the body of Christ. If one part of that body lets down, the others suffer until God replaces them. I've often had people come to me and say, Pastor, I just can't do this anymore. I need a break. That's okay. It may be tough for a while, but... God will have somebody else who will come in and take that position. We're the body of Christ. If, if I take my arm and cut it off, well, 
How am I going to tie my shoes? <laughs> if I take my foot and cut it off, how am I going to walk? I, I need all parts of my body to function properly. We need everybody in church who's doing things just to function properly and keep doing what you're doing. We're the body of Christ. We serve Him. We serve Him by learning to give. We serve Him by having a generous spirit. Uh, there was a story, I, I don't know if it's true or not, but it's a story. On the way home from church, a man was complaining about everything. The music was too loud. The sermon was too long. The announcements were unclear and unnecessary. The building was too hot. People were grumpy, and it just went on and on and on. His young son finally said him to Dad, you've got to admit it wasn't a bad show for just a dollar. The amount of money isn't the issue. The amount of work that I do for God isn't the issue. The generous spirit is the issue. In Luke 21, we find a widow. She gave all she had. The widow's might, we call it. There was a rich man who gave the same amount of money that she had given. And, and Jesus said, who's the greatest? That woman who gave sacrificially. I made three statements this morning. Let me explain. God doesn't need your money. It's His church and His work, and He will keep it going. If you don't give, He'll find somebody who else will, and you'll miss a blessing. I'm not going to beg for your money. Obviously, a money, obviously, from a business standpoint, the church needs money. If everybody would tithe, you know what? The church wouldn't have any problems at all. Basically, our church is doing pretty good. I thank God for the generous spirit of our people. I, 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 and I, I just encourage you to keep doing what you're doing. I just keep, encourage you to keep, keep doing what you're doing. God's going to keep blessing you. What you give is between you and God. I, I, I don't know who gives what. I, I have access to those records. I don't look. I don't need to. I'm not going to beg you to do things for the church. There's obviously things that need doing. There's ministries that need to be done. There's some not very pleasant weekly things that need attention every week. We have people who do those. We have people who clean the bathrooms. We have people who run the vacuum cleaners. Some weeks we have community service workers that take care of all of that. And when that happens, all the people say, well, I knew a few would say amen. We have people who take the trash out. We have, we have people who wash windows. It all needs to be done. There's ministries that have to be done in the church that, that, that people do. Uh, kids Sunday school classes and youth programs and, and, and occasional painting and all kinds of different things. Uh, last night as I, as I shared um, a report for our church, I, I think I said... Oh yeah, I read my notes that are real big. I mentioned our compassionate ministry, how we can reach out and help people in need. We need people involved in that ministry. I, I mentioned our youth outreach epic, uh, Jesse and, 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 and uh, Millie and, and Corey. Yeah, yeah. You know, Mar Marcy works with the kids on Wednesday nights. We have that Bible study on Tuesdays out at at the assisted living place. And, and, and all of those things are ministries that, that keep going. We have our online ministry where, you know, last week we had 18 people in church. We had 30 online last week. Yeah, some of you sitting here were online. And you, one person told me that I don't look as good online as I do in public. Well, you see widescreen, you know, it's... Short and wide. <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, uh, but it takes people to keep those things going. There's other ministries I would like to see us get involved in, but what I'm going to say is if you don't volunteer, God in His time will find, some, find somebody else who will, and then He will bless their lives. Malachi 3.10 and Luke 6.38, both end with promises. Malachi 3.10 says, 
I will pour out a blessing to your life. Luke 6.38 says, Men will give into your bosom. Billy Graham said, If a person gets his attitude towards money and others straight, it will help him straighten out almost every other area in his life. What does God want? He wants all of us to be available for him all the time. Test God in this. Get involved. Be a cheerful giver. Be a cheerful encourager of other people. Stretch your finances. Stretch your time. I, lately, I, I, I've been on this kick for a while that, that, man, I just don't have time to do this. I don't have time to do that. For, for quite a while, I was just feeling really, really pressured. I, I just, just don't have the time. Well, you know what? My phone pops up a message every once in a while. How much time do I need? How much time do I spend on here? I'm, I'm looking at a message. Kurt just sent me a message and told me if I cut off my foot, I don't need to worry about tying my shoe from my missing hand. Anyhow, uh, uh, I, I've had messages pop up telling me I've spent six, seven, eight hours a week on this. Not on the phone talking, Googling things, Facebooking. What a waste of time. <laughs> Some of you are. And, and I've cut that back to a couple hours, Judy. <laughs> um, what I have discovered is, is I've stretched my time and I've gotten more involved with others, more involved with praying. I'm watching God give me all the time I need to get other things done. I have not had a week lately where I've struggled on getting Sunday's message together because all of a sudden the time's there. The thoughts are just rolling in my mind. Stretch yourself and watch God work everything else out. Well, let me tell you, there's power in God's generosity towards us. Not only did He send His Son to die on the cross to save us from our sins, Psalms 23 says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Think about how generous God has to be to take care of us, His sheep, and not make sure that we have no wants, that our things that we need are met. That's the generosity of God. There's power in God's generosity towards us. There's power in being generosity with God. And, and the promises again there is when we're generous with God, He will pour blessings from the floodgates of heaven being opened that we won't be able to contain. And I look at all of those blessings. They're not just financial blessings. They're health, their guidance, their physical protection is spiritual joy that comes because we were faithful to God. Back in that time, I mentioned it was crops that were being protected. I wonder, what is protected in our lifetime today because we're faithful to God? Could it be that our livelihood is protected in this day and age? I think so. Could it be that those who are on Social Security, that your Social Security is protected, that your retirement income is protected because you're faithful to God? Could it be all that food in your freezer is protected? I think so. God protects those who are generous with Him in everything of their life. There's power in being generous with others, both materially and in spirit and in treatment. If we do unto others as we want them to do unto us, that's going to come back to us. And the Bible is very simple. Poured out blessings will men give to your bosom. What goes around comes around. I already said it. The flip side is already true. If you give out garbage, you're going to get garbage in return. There's power in a generous spirit. I look at this whole thing of judging and condemning. I go back to the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not kill. I did some studying a few years ago on what that thou shalt not kill exactly means. It doesn't just mean physically. It also means emotionally. Breaking someone's spirit. 
not encouraging them. As I look at that, and, 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 I, and I look at the New Testament version of given it will be given, treat each other with kindness. I realize I have to be generous in my thoughts and in my encouragement. And I find, I find that there's power in making somebody else's day by just smiling at them. I, I was walking through, I can't even remember, I think it was been Walmart yesterday we were walking through. And somebody I didn't even know walked by me and looked at me and smiled and said, Hi, hope you're having a good day. Really? <laughs> I smiled back at him. Hope you are too. The spirit of generosity, the spirit of positivity, the spirit of encouragement. And you know what happens when we do all that? God is glorified. We need to glorify Him in our lives and just remember that there's power. There's power in prayer. There's power in faith. There's power in a generous spirit.